about the project called the Loopit, an open source project that started uh, uh, about two years ago. Uh, the goal, as you can uh, guess from the name, is to combine R and Loop. And speak up, is that the request? Yeah, you should sure have yeah. 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 I thought you were going to suggest get taller so that <laughs> <laughs> you can speak in charge if you don't mind. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, yes. 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 Okay. Good. Uh, this, the noise is a little uh, concerning. <laughs> I don't think it's going to blow up. Okay. Uh, if you just say, <laughs> if you say so. Hey. Um. Sorry. If Do you want to? Yeah. I think I can. This project, uh, it's an open source project. Uh, the goal is uh, uh, to connect R and Loop. And uh, I'm now going to go into uh, something that uh, you're going to experience for the first time, an introduction to it. Should I skip it completely? Or uh, who, who doesn't know a do at all? Um, OK, so uh, it's, it's, um, I, uh, it's, uh, so it's only two people now in a really uh, difficult spot because uh, I'm going to keep it short. That's the only solution. Uh, it's uh, an integrated software, we call it an operating system that works on the cluster on, on large set of computers. It's made a lot, a lot easier to manage uh, a very large amounts of data and launch uh, enormous computation. That's uh, the version for when only 1% of the audience doesn't know how to. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it has lots of components, one of which allows you to uh, launch this massive computation. That's the one that's most, uh, it's called MapReduce. It's the most interesting tonight uh, uh, for us, just in this context. So, uh, there's a little disconnect here. Does it uh, uh, starts with uh, a bunch of data on, on many, many machines, split in ways that you don't uh, really control too much in, in, in the detail or you don't have to. Uh, uh, starts a transformation. Uh, every, um, you can imagine anything a filter, a selection of fields, uh, any other kind of computation on the data, whatever it is. And that part is called the map. The map produces uh, some data. And uh, a key attached to this data, the data is normally called there, you want it together with a key. And the key drives the group in the next phase. It's like uh, a group by, if you are familiar with SQL. Uh, once the data is grouped according to this key, uh, another phase, is, phase starts called reduce. Again, it's spread all over the cluster. It can be any parallel, depends on how many keys you have, of course. Uh, and uh, any transformation is applied to the data this time, uh, you're guaranteed to have all the data related to a key. In one, in, one, in one spot. So the map phase is kind of a work. Whatever data is available, just work on it. Then there's a grouping, then finally the reduce phase. As the name suggests, this is normal an aggregation phase, and the data comes out smaller uh, after the reduce. But it doesn't have to, it's just a common pattern. So now a moment about R, and I have to ask the same question, should I give an introduction to R? Uh, uh, who's familiar with R? Okay, so I'm going to go for the five minute this time because it's a little more split. Uh, it's a language created by statisticians for statisticians. Somewhere started in the early 90s, but uh, uh, it comes from a, uh, uh, it's a derivative of a proprietary language uh, called S, plus, which itself is a derivative of many other things. Uh, uh, you could, uh, the strongest influences in R are uh, Scheme and APL. So lots of functions and lots of vectors. Uh, a matrix uh, type of operations. Uh, uh, now, uh, if I try to convince you that how important it is, it's always uh, it's always a difficult uh, difficult statement, especially, especially for emergent emergent uh, emergent languages. I can tell you, Java is important. <laughs> we're not going to have a, 
uh, discussion about it. Uh, but that's that's the present and past. Uh, you know, how do you guess which is going to be the language of the future, or more important, the future? So this is the, the, the growth in number of packages, which are the largest unit of modularity in R, are a way to extend the language. They're written by many different kinds of people, including very smart statisticians. So these packages uh, implement uh, uh, the modern knowledge about uh, computational <coughs> statistics. Uh, so much so that the two competitors, Mathematica and uh, SAS, offer the ability to execute uh, R from within their packages. Because uh, the newest uh, and hottest method can, are, you should appear in the literature first uh, accompanied by an implementation in R. Uh, there's lots of stuff in the packages. There's uh, uh, graph analysis. There's uh, um, fantastic graphics. But there is a strong suit in statistics. Uh, I mean, fantastic statistical graphics, not general problems. Uh, if you tell me you should abandon any other language to use R, then I always uh, cite you know, things like uh, a synchronous input. I've never seen a library that does a synchronous I.O. In, in R. So no, it's not the. Uh, it, the language itself is pretty much general purpose, but the community and the packages around it are, are very statistic, statistically focused. Uh, Orani called it a hot language in its uh, review of the market uh, together with JavaScript. Interesting combination. Uh, Google uh, went from uh, a few lost souls who were using it three years ago to a major supported language. They have a project like Redoop. Uh, uh, of course, much better being Google, and uh, <laughs> and, uh, and and uh, and so so that R is integrated, or can asset access all their um, super scalable storage and compute the facilities. Uh, and there's this website called R for Stats that uh, does this kind of stuff much better than I can do. I collects all information about the, the growth of R and how relevant it's become. Like other open source projects, it has uh, a company back in it. Uh, so that's a sign of, uh, of the development, you know, coming of age. This, this company is called Revolution, and it's uh, paying me to develop it, uh, to develop Redoop, not R. Uh, so Revolution does, you know, starts with this open source project and provides uh, extensions for uh, working on large data sets. Some are proprietary, uh, Redoop instead is an open source project. Uh, other extension for uh, more traditional <coughs> performance computing, uh, and then uh, um, a software that allows you to deploy it in, in a large environment as a web service, and, uh, and finally a healthy of training and consult. So, uh, revolutionanalytics.com is the uh, very first uh, um, URL. Please go and check them out. Uh, so we even have uh, Redoop as a as a and a logo. It, as you can see, there's a little bit of R and a little bit of elephant in it. <laughs> it comes from an idea of uh, that technology, whose name, unfortunately, I can't remember right now. And then it was uh, put into reality by Ed Colley at uh, Blue Zappa. He's done, he's been one of my favorite you know, early adopters, but uh, he's also provided the, the logo. So, what we're trying to do, besides you know, uh, developing uh, Q icons, is, uh, is to uh, give you the ability to uh, do analytics uh, in a sophisticated way uh, on the largest uh, data sets. And when I say sophisticated, you know, I always say, uh, uh, why, why, don't, why don't you, why do you really need R to do sophisticated analytics? In fact, it's not impossible to do it with other language. Absolutely, I'm not saying that. But uh, I always uh, uh, mention the, the quantile function. The quantile function that comes with eight methods built in. It, it has defaults. You don't have to know a lot about how to compute quantiles. But uh, if you look at the implementation, there's a, a pile of papers like this implemented behind that simple function. So that in special situations where uh, the bias of your quantiles is really important for the variance, you can, uh, you can uh, uh, select a different method that uh, um, satisfies your trade-offs better. And, and it's all like this. It's really, it's really deep on statistics, and uh, it's uh, you, you can't find anything of that uh, scale in any other language.
So uh, the project uh, has uh, three main packages. There's a fourth one, but uh, it's only for testing. Uh, and they're named after um, corresponding to two components that uh, mm -hmm. the package uh, allows you to interface with from a RHDFS, of course, is the file system, RHDFS. RHBase is the, um, is the Hadoop database, and uh, RMR, now a two because uh, there's a history behind it, uh, is uh, the MapReduce component. So uh, I'm going to go into a little bit of uh, advocacy. Why should you use uh, um, Hadoop, and in particular RMR? Uh, and the simplest motivation is that uh, somebody has already put the data in a loop. They didn't ask the analytics person, so now you deal with it. You know, and it's, it's always like that. It's very occasional you hear that the uh, architecture was de designed from the ground up to, to make the statistician happy. Uh, so the data is in a loop, and the uh, related argument is the biggest uh, cluster is a loop. So if you are using R and you're using it like on a big server, and you're kind of uh, exceeding at this point, uh, the limits uh, of the server, uh, you have to pony up money for a ever bigger machine, uh, including some uh, uh, improbable, horrible R appliance. And um, instead, you know, your your friends and who run the website have this gigantic Hadoop cluster uh, with lots of machines and cycles available. So you want the data, uh, you want the compute power, and, and you go with the two. So it's kind of a practical reason. That's the way it is. Uh, also, there's always an advantage in accessing the data where, where it is without having a copy. Uh, to do an, if you do an extraction from the main warehouse to uh, your own uh, repository that's more available to do data analysis, then you have to maintain a copy. It becomes stale the moment you do it. And you need additional uh, code, additional uh, storage space. How nice would it be if there is one warehouse where, uh, in which the website can run and, and, and the analytical person can uh, can get its data and it's all simplified. So that, that's a promise. The other reason, especially if you're coming, you know, you're already invested, you're already selected, you want R. And that's, that's your strong suit or it's a, a major thing in your company, so you want R. Well, this RMR is very, uh, it's just elaborate. It doesn't change uh, your workflow drastically. It's not a change of language, that's of course. I would say, of course, but if you hear other people talk, they say, no, I want because we don't only do statistics in Java. Okay, that, but that, that's a boss say that he doesn't write the line of code, but uh, you know, uh, if, if, uh, uh, if you have to deal with real people, you might have excellent statisticians who are, don't know Java, who are a lot slower if they have to code in Java, or they don't have a quantile function in, in uh, Java with eight different implementations behind it. So they have to recode it rather than reuse it. So you can stay with that. Uh, but not only you stay with your favorite language for, statist uh, for statistics, but uh, also you're running it in your regular interpreter. So unlike uh, Dumbo for Python, uh, here there's no special runtime. It's not the patchy version of R. It's not uh, Revolution R. You can use Revolution R if you want, but uh, it's not mandatory by any, uh, by any means. Uh, and, uh, uh, and you can just use your IDE, whatever you're, you're, you're used to, or uh, used our studio. And, uh, and you can port your code a bit at a time. So statistically, you have a pipeline, an ethical pipeline, and, uh, and you start with huge amounts of data, and you go down, down, down. And the first thing that start uh, first thing that the seems is, is the first. So you write that with RMR, get the data in memory, and off you go with the rest. So you don't have to say, OK, we take the website down for six months, uh, we stop making a recommendation for six months until everything is written in high. You know, and no, here you just you take the first piece, you uh, hopefully that piece reduces the data set uh, uh, by a factor that's sufficient for you to continue with your old uh, with your old code and your old machine after that. And gradually you go to to writing everything with this uh, with this uh, you know uh, high scalability tools. And also you can use all the packages. Uh, and that here I want to explain one thing, that it's not like uh, if there is like a package that does uh, generalized linear models, that because you load the RMR suddenly, that package is ported to parallel distributed computing. Now, that's unfortunately, we, we haven't solved the problem of uh, 
parallel programming. So we can't convert any algorithm into its parallel version. But uh, uh, what you can do, you can use everything you know inside the mapper or the reducer, this ancillary function that we'll explain in a moment. So as part of a larger scheme of things, which is the map reduce, uh, you can run any package uh, you're familiar with and, and any package you need. For instance, you could uh, uh, split a gazillion uh, users in uh, data about uh, lots of users into uh, specific smaller data sets and then create a linear model uh, for each user. Now each user has a you know, resolved amount of data uh, and then uh, and then you store the model somewhere for further use. Uh, that you can do by using a LAN. It's not like a giant linear model, it's millions of smaller linear models. Uh, and other situations where you really have to come up with a new algorithm, those are, you know, uh, those are still, uh, you still have to code those uh, with your creativity. Uh, not only it's, uh, it's just a library, but we try to make it as integrated with the language as possible. And that's kind of a little bit fuzzy statement that you see as we go. But uh, uh, R is a functional language, uh, at least the origins are there. And, uh, uh, and so uh, the path reduce primitives, uh, the, the, the R structure of path reduce uh, existed, uh, uh, has existed for a long time before Google came up with the parallel distributed version. And uh, in fact, in, in R, uh, I think they were went to the, in the Lisp community. I, I, I imagine I, uh, even I wasn't born back then. So uh, uh, R has several versions of uh, uh, MapReduce uh, built in. They are local in memory. They have slightly, slightly different flavor, flavors. One version of Map is this uh, supply function. So if you have a collection of data, you call a supply data function, it will apply that function to each element of data and return a collection with all the return values. Uh, if you have to do it on a huge data set that's, that's uh, containing big data, now big data is not in memory. Big data is some, I'll talk about that, it's a handle that wants to do a file somewhere, right? Uh, in, a, in a distributed file system. But what might reduce big data, and then you pass a map function does, it's about the same. It goes through all the, Data, all the data points represent a big data, applies the function passed as an argument. Uh, well, function is a keyword in, in R, so that, that's not clear code. Uh, and then and then returns the results and write them to some other to some other uh, uh, location on the, uh, the, the file system. So it really integrates well with everything you do understand in R. And there are other, other aspects, and one I'm particularly proud of is that we try to uh, um, uh, respect uh, 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 scoping rules, uh, even uh, across uh, machine boundaries, which I think is a unique uh, feature of this library versus any other uh, any other loop library, even in other languages. Not that I know all of them, you know, or, uh, I'm not extremely familiar with all of them, but I, 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 I think it's a good guess that this is unique to this library, and we have an example of that later on. So if you come from uh, uh, you are not uh, married to R, you're looking at multiple languages. I was at this point, at some point in my career, and uh, I don't this didn't exist back then. Back then. So I came up with this categorization. There are two dimensions, and, uh, and on the vertical side, there's sort of kind of high level, low level, uh, interpreted dynamic versus static compiled uh, uh, kind of thing. And left and right is uh, should we uh, embrace my produce, give access to the developer directly, or should we put uh, some indirect direction in between uh, uh, the code and the actual map produce machinery? So the, the languages on the left, uh, uh, sorry, on the right, uh, the libraries of languages, uh, have a plan and optimizer that takes your uh, code and maps it to a number of jobs that's not necessarily uh, connected with the number of map produce calls, calls you make. In fact, there, there aren't even map produce calls. In, in the ones on the left, uh, pretty much it's one to one. There's an up-reduce call, and that becomes a, an actual job. So, uh, uh, so at the at the, um, at the upper level, high and peak are dedicated languages. So they are in they are in in, uh, in um, a slanted uh, font in italics because of that. Uh, it's a different thing. They say that they are built exactly for that. Uh, just use them. Uh, and I heard it in the seminar this morning. And, uh, and so my counter argument is that, you know, they're a little bit of a trap 
for what they do, they're fantastic. They're very useful. I use Hive extensively. Big I haven't just because of uh, history, not because I have anything against it. Uh, but I found this, when you want to do tough stuff that you can't just code in SQL, you're in trouble. And, and my favorite example comes from the Hortonworks blog. And, and uh, it's not that I want to pick on the Hortonworks guys. It's because, it's because if they don't know how to write this stuff, uh, certainly I don't. And I don't know who does. Uh, uh, this is the implementation of key means in P. So it's three slides. It's a small font because I don't want you to understand it. So I just don't, don't get the headache right now. Okay? But three slides, OK? The peak is this string here in blue, uh, uh, below the, the mid section here. Uh, so it's key means in pig, uh, so to speak. It's all in Python, essentially. And the last slide is Java. So you need three languages to do key means in pig. Uh, of course, pig, uh, you know, uh, there's, uh, it's effective in other ways. It's probably efficient because pig has all these optimizations. Uh, no discussion, but from the point of the aesthetics of the code and the ease of developing this debugging, I don't think it's so ideal. I think having a self-contained, you know, Python-only or R-only solution is better. Plus, these languages are new; they don't have all the trappings of a sort of a real programming language. Say this starts to be, they say they are not real. It starts to be a little polemical, offensive. Just I don't want to go there. I'm just saying uh, the boolean type has been added to peak in the summer. I'm not aware that they have any module, uh, modularity construct. If you go to the middle le level, all these languages here, the more mature and the less mature, Python, R, uh, what is there, uh, Clojure, and Scala, they all have a rich type system. They all have modularity constructs. They all have first class functions. Uh, so those are real languages. And when I real say, you know, I want to be inclusive, you know, just have all this this, this uh, set of uh, features that are uh, really uh, standard uh, in modern programming languages. And so they allow you to do uh, much more and much more expressive. If you go down to, uh, to, the, uh, to the Java level, of course, that's where you get the most speed. Uh, but there's a risk, right? Because you have to write more code. You don't have, uh, 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 they may be harder for no specialist uh, to deal with. And you know, the more code you write, the harder it is to pull off a project. There are plenty of experimental studies now that, that show that. So I think there's this long-term tendency towards higher level dynamic languages. And, uh, and, uh, but at the same time, I think you should stay within the, uh, the confines of real languages that allow you to do any algorithm and express it with, with great power. So why would you go with RMR here? I think uh, the, the strong suits are it's a both R is what is interactive, so if you do exploratory analysis in the real programming language, uh, many other languages uh, have a read evaluate uh, uh, print loop. Uh, I'm not sure. Python is like Python, which is a growing project, but it's not, uh, I think, uh, as developed as, uh, as, as R as a shell. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, 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 Clojure Scala. Uh, then R has uh, this uh, huge repertoire of very uh, deeply developed statistical feature, has very good graphics, and they say publication quality. Uh, and uh, uh, now it's also the ability to create web interfaces. So if they tell you, I, I, I want a dashboard, you have to do it in Ruby. You say, no, I'm going to do it in R. I'm going to give up. Give up. I want to produce the right numbers first, and then I'm going to use Shiny and make a beautiful web interface. So you might expect that shiny from your studio guys. Uh, uh, so if you combine this thing interactivity, real programming language, strong statistics, and graphics, uh, I think uh, it's kind of a unique combination for R and the right one. So let's skip this bad code. And so I'm going to go ahead and show you some, some real code. And I'm going to start really basic because I couldn't really assume that everybody knew R, but also it's, it's my strategy, you know, it's my, my way of approaching things. If you don't get identity function right, if it is boiled rate just to write a low word, yeah, you lost already. Uh, so really, this is the ABC of uh, RMR. There are two functions that uh, allow you to go from memory to the distributed data store and, and back. They're both to DFS and from the FS. Uh, they use files behind the scenes, but you don't have to know the names. You don't have to delete them at the end. All temporary results 
uh, are deleted unless the program quits in some uh, awful, awful way. But uh, most of the time, the temporary space is cleaned up, right? And uh, 2DFS starts from memory, put things on the distributed app store. And from DFS, uh, that's the opposite direction. So you know, those are both useless, right? Because if, if the data is in memory, it's small data. So why would you put it on uh, Hadoop? And if it's uh, on a loop, but it won't fit in memory, right? So, no, it's a from the effects is useful because your computations decrease in size, right? And, uh, and so there's a point where you can load data into main memory and then you produce a graph or you print it or, uh, or you make a decision about the, the rest of the computation. I think that's the most important for me. You look at, uh, you, you, come, up, you uh, come up with a summary, then you load it in memory, inspect it, and decide, okay, we got enough, uh, that, uh, enough, uh, you know, the, the training error is right, or we want to go for another iteration. That's how you decide, you go from DFS. You have to do it responsibly from DFS that does not check the size for you. Uh, you, can, you can exceed the memory limits. And 2DFS actually is not so useful in production, but it's fantastic for learning, debugging, all the, uh, the test suit, where there's a quite extensive set of tests with the package. It's all written self-contained because it's 2DFS. I create a vector, I do 2DFS, and pop, I have a file that represents that vector in memory. It's always like 100,000 elements or a million elements or something like that. You don't need a loop, but it's nice to have this ability to create a small data sets uh, as, you need, as, as you go. And now a favorite function, the identity. I like to say that I'm, I'm, I'm the only person paid in here to write the identity function. Uh, they don't pay me a lot just for this function. <laughs> uh, and so that, that's what it is. That's a map reduce call. Uh, it has an input which can be either a file or one of these objects like the ones returned from 2DFS uh, or the ones returned by another map reduce job that returns one of these big data objects that points to data indirectly. So you can pass them around and, and compose more complex function, more complex uh, uh, programs or how they call them today, workflows, programs as they say in the 90s. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then you pass a function a map function, it has a couple of uh, peculiarities. So it reads a, uh, a key and a value, but uh, R is strongly vector oriented. It actually, it's pretty lame with scalars. The efficiency is pretty unacceptable when you're working with scalars. So the map function is vectorized. The key is actually a collection of keys, and the, and the vector is actually a collection of, vectors, collection of, uh, of values. So key, K and V are all these uh, collections can be uh, one of the four main collections in R, and we may even extend it one day, it's vectors, lists, uh, uh, matrices, and other frames. And then uh, you always return a key value pair with this function called keyval, uh, and again, it's vectorized, You're, you generate multiple key value pairs at the same time with one call. And that's a trick to have good efficiency uh, with R, all these manipulated vectors or other collections. So from here, take a big step forward, a filter, filter operation, okay? I, I like the quote from uh, Anna Kay, simple things should be simple and complex things should be possible. So we're gonna go through uh, some steps at the end of scaling and you see it's simpler, it's possible, it's even simpler than than in Python. So here we have a predicate function, you know, it's just a function of a key and the value, uh, and the key argument is a dot because I'm not gonna use it, so I change the name. It's just a name, okay, dot. Uh, I always use it when an when argument is, uh, is not important. Uh, and uh, we compute some uh, function of it, the return value is a, is a vector of booleans, right? So it's a kind of a mask, a yeah, predicate returns a mask. Kind of and then uh, how do we use it? Uh, map reduce function, of course, it has an input. And, uh, and you can pass a parameter which is a map fun. Uh, it's called a map. It's a function of a key and the value. And then we apply the predicate function to the key and the value. It returns a mask or filter. And then we filter the key and the value with that filter. Uh, that will work for uh, uh, vectors and lists for uh, uh, two dimensional data structure. You need to add a comma, but that's very simple in one shot. So that's a filter. Uh, an interesting feature here is that a predicate is available here in the definition uh, just because, because it's in lexical scope, uh, you know, the R follows lexical scoping, it's a variant of the many 
uh, possible lexicoscopic rules and that and, and so predicate is defined up there but it's available here but the interesting thing is that this function is executed in a different building right and so uh, people say why don't you just use streaming you know without that well you have to go through a lot of hoops to serialize this distribute it efficiently to all the nodes reload it on the other side and you get this strong illusion of being working on a single machine that's just more powerful but you know, there's lots that going on, goes on to get your predicate, this predicate where, where it belongs. On the other hand, that makes it very easy for you to write very parameterize your map reduce jobs a lot and make it very general, general enough to write the same thing and cut and paste every time. Select. We're getting more advanced here. So how you do a select? Here, I for some reason I included also the input generation. So I. Uh, you don't need to learn how on the fly here. I just created a little data set. All these examples are not cut and paste because you know you have to uh, put your code where your mouth is. So all my code in the presentation is included directly from the test suit. Uh, so that is it is executed every time I, I run the checks of the package. I'm sure that the code in the presentation is also coming. Because if you preach reuse, you have also to practice. You have also to practice it, right? So uh, this is how we create a little dat data frame with three columns. Data frame is a, is a typical tabular data structure in R that contains experiments. Uh, every column corresponds to a different variable, every row a different observation. Uh, here we have three columns, so one with two with numbers and the third with characters, but just, just random stuff. And then I put it on, on uh, in the same data store with 2DFS just because I want to run a test, right? Uh, and then, uh, and then the variable input select as the handle that allows me to, to process that data and pass it around. And then and the important thing is just uh, these two meager lines. There's a lot of lines because my lines are short. You know, it's just uh, if you count the lines, I tend to write lots of lines. But I'd rather count the characters. That, that I prefer that. So um, we grab that handle as the input, the first argument. And that the map function is a function of key and value, the key we discarded. And then, uh, and then we just grab a column of the, um, the column from the data frame. That's the syntax to access a column. That there are, uh, you could also do it with square brackets, but that's one way. So you see, essentially, it's the same way you grab a column from a data frame. You just do it inside the map function instead of doing it uh, outside because the data frame is out there on disk. It's too big. You can do it, but it's the same. Way. Once you put the map reduce around it, it's the same code. And that's, it, that's the idea, that the simple things, you just put the map function around it, and it's a simple code. Uh, for complex algorithms, it's not, it's not that way. Now, these are map-only operations. Is that reducing this package? Yes, we didn't forget the reduce part. So again, I'm creating some uh, uh, data set, uh, uh, get some numbers from the normal distribution, put them in a vector called big sample, put the vector on a file, uh, somewhere, return the handle uh, from 2DFS into the variable input.pixel, and that's uh, how you use it. MapReduce takes as input uh, this handle, input.pixel, and the map function. Uh, yeah, since uh, this is a little different from the maps you're used to, it has a flavor of a reduce more than a map because uh, here I just want to sum all the numbers. There's no grouping, okay? So I can start summing them as they come. And, uh, and, and the map function is vectorized because of the R peculiarities and queries. So uh, in the map function, right away, I start summing all the values together. I return a key value with a fixed key, as in one, could be any constant, and the sum of all the values as a value. And guess what? This function is exactly the same function. Actually, I could have factored it out and give, uh, given it a name and use it twice. So you start with reduce early, which is actually a major efficiency recommendation for my reduce jobs. Reduce early, reduce often. Right? There's a combiner feature that is uh, meant to implement that recommendation and, and more. And in fact, I turn on the combiner here because uh, uh, a combiner is going to apply the reduce early. You can do it when the reduce operation is associative or commutative. This one is, so you can do it. And then something more complicated, group and aggregate, of course, mm -hmm. C plus style. Again, uh, creating a, an input, this time is a matrix, just for, to show that you can process many different types of R things. Uh, this time is a matrix. 
and uh, these are the group uh, and aggregate function that take the mod and uh, just do the sum. It's just to show you that you could put your function group and aggregate uh, variables and then the rest will be the same because of scope rules and the fact that the package tries to uphold them. Uh, so the map preview scope is, again, the input is the input we just created. The map function takes a key in the value and returns the, applies the group, uh, grouping function to the value, in this case, it's just for the example, and returns, uh, sorry, uh, applies the group function to the first uh, column of the matrix and applies and returns the second column of the matrix as is. And the reduce function takes the key and applies the aggregation to the values. Uh, in this case, aggregation is uh, associative commutative, so you can turn on the combiner. Uh, so that's uh, how you do a more resolvable aggregation where there are first, first the grouping phase and then, and then the aggregation. Uh, now, uh, this is the low word of the back reduce word, uh, the word count uh, problem. So I, I cannot, uh, I had to have an implementation myself. So in this case, I'm gonna also show you, you how to create an abstraction, which is actually trivial because it's just a function that contains an up reduce hole, that's what it is. It has this function as, as an input and an optional output and an optional pattern that defines what the word does in the text. Then we have the map reduce call. Uh, it has an input, it has an output. Uh, the output is optional, so if you don't put an output or a null, it will find this one of these temporary files and, and whatnot. But you can also tell map reduce, oh, this data is, is not uh, temporary. This is important, write it there, and that, that works too. Uh, then the map reduce function, these times are named. I, I, have them, I have them on the next slide. Combine and resolve. And the input format parameter. I, I can't go into input output formats, but certainly we didn't forget that this stuff doesn't run in isolation. So it reads a number of things. Uh, uh, binary native R format for maximum compatibility, compatibility, but also type bytes, which is a binary interchange format that's kind of uh, popular with Java folks. And, uh, and uh, text formats of the CSV, the most popular so far. Uh, and the free text, in this case, for natural language processing. And uh, it also does a way of uh, creating your own input formats with, with high flexibility. We're working on HPA's input format right now, and uh, maybe I'm forgetting a JSON. Uh, well, JSON is kind of broken, so maybe I shouldn't mention it. But, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 we don't want to we don't want this to be an island. It's going to have to talk with some Java component, other people using Python. So that is that possibility. Really. So now to the map reduce functions, the map function gets a key that doesn't matter, and a bunch of lines. And uh, uh, let's read that. Oh, sorry. Uh, the map function takes a bunch of lines and uh, starts splitting them. So let's read the complex expression from inside. Start splitting them, apply the pattern, which is available because of scope rules. No boilerplate, no nothing to get your pattern in there into every node, by the way. And then uh, the string split returns the splits for each line. We don't care. We're just counting words. So we mix everything with that unleashed. So you just get the vector of the words. And then with key val, uh, we return that vector of words as keys and uh, as value the number one. So uh, basic form of key val, the number of keys and values to be the same. But if you don't do that, it's a very popular feature of many functions in R. It's not, it's not like defining the language, but it's a convention. It's called recycling. So the shorter of the two collections would be reused from the beginning until you get enough elements. And so that's typically useful when you have many versus one. You can imagine, instead, if you didn't have recycling, instead of that one, I would have to count how many words came from the other argument and then repeat one as many times as any. No, all the water plate is under. You don't have to deal with it. So this say for every word that returns a count of one. That's all it says. And then we have the reduce function. Guess what? It's again the sum of everything. We've seen that this one three times, I think. Right? And finally, I, I'm gonna make it k means. We're gonna show it to the big guys. So there's the first part is a, a little bit of R. So in R, everything that's scalar is slow. So 
I have to write a function that computes the distance between a matrix, matrix of centers and the matrix of points without too many loops. So there's an outer loop that applies a loop on the rows that sit on the first dimension, which means the rows of matrix C, the matrix of centers. But then I don't use any other loops. So I don't loop over the matrix of points, which is, which is generally bigger. I'm completely skipping k-means because I'm late. But uh, I, I, see, I see inside you that you know, guys, you guys know k-means very deeply, so I don't need to explain what it is, I, I, I'm sure. Uh, and so this thing is just computing a gradient distance with matrix operation. So the fact that R has a huge number of fast uh, matrix primitives, sometimes uh, when it doesn't, you have to bend the ones that are there. In this case, I, this transpose here is not very intuitive. So it just, it's a little bit of experience. If worse come to worse, it's very easy to interface with C, uh, with RCDP, and uh, create your own matrix primitive. So, then you have to write C, of course, uh, it fits a purpose, but if it's limited to it, a few crucial areas of your code, then I, I, at least I can deal with that, with that compromise. In this case, with a little trickery, I managed to, to do everything without uh, writing any C code. And there are 700 plus you know, built-in functions that do all the most common things, and somebody has written the C for you before. Uh, plus the packages, of course, many of which are implemented in C. So this is the map function. Uh, it has, uh, okay, uh, it has, uh, uh, it starts with two options. One, if there is no C matrix yet, and, uh, and the other, if uh, there is a, a set of candidate centers. So the first iteration, you start, uh, you have only the points, right? So no centers yet available. And, uh, and so uh, to compute the nearest point, uh, sorry guys, I'm, I'm skipping here logically. So it's a function of the key and the value, as usual. The key doesn't matter here. The value is a matrix of points P. Okay, so every row is a different element. Now, we inspect the, to compute the, the nearest center to each point, we inspect the matrix of centers. And that's another thing. The matrix of center is supposed to assume to be a lot smaller than the matrix of points. And so it's available just because of scope rules. You don't have to have a separate Hadoop input. So no joins, uh, nothing complicated. If it's small enough to fit in memory, the system which are distributed all around. So let's say we have uh, up to 100,000 centers, nothing more than that. So we check the matrix, if it's empty, it means that we have to come up with the first candidate. So uh, we just sample uh, randomly the number of clusters uh, as many times as, as there are rows in the matrix P, and that's the first uh, definition of what's closest to what. Uh, if uh, in the normal iteration where we have a set of candidate center, we compute the matrix D of distances between, uh, with that function we just showed you, between the centers and the points, and then find the nearest with that max call uh, primitive. That's one of those magic things, you know, it's written in C underneath, and it does a full loop, but you don't have to think about it. Uh, so the max call returns the column with the maximum element for each row. And since I put the minus in front of the distance, that's a way of to, find, to find the smallest uh, the smallest distance in each row, in each row, which means uh, that's a closest center. Uh, then there's a, a little thing about combiners, which I'm going to skip right now. And then, uh, so if there is no combining in action, uh, we just return uh, this key value pair, which has the vector of nearest points mm -hmm. and the matrix of points. Uh, And uh, the reduce, again, there's two versions, uh, slightly different whether you're using the combiner or not. For speed, you should use the one <coughs> combiner. But uh, let's look at the plain vanilla one, which is the top one, when there's no combining in action. Again, you get the key. Uh, here, it, it, it really, the key doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that all the points that ended up closest to the same center are together in this matrix P. And uh, if you're not combining, this matrix P could be a little too big. So it's important to use the combine. Uh, but, the, but anyway, that's it. Uh, that's all the points you need to average to get your new set of centers. And that's exactly what the second line does. It creates, a, with apply P2 mean, it does the sum of the, uh, the mean of the columns. Uh, unfortunately, apply returns a, another data structure we don't support, which is a, uh, as a key value, uh, which is an R value, so I translate into a matrix with S matrix, and then for some reason it's transposed, so I have to transpose it to get again uh, 
uh, one sector on each row, otherwise it's reversed. And then put everything together, Q means not MR, uh, it's a function of P, the stand P is not a matrix, it's one of those handles, uh, big data handles for objects, and then it takes a number of clusters, a number of iterations, uh, and whether or not to use combine. You start with a new matrix of centers, iterate over the required number of iterations, of course, the series implementation would have that in a last criteria, not just a fixed number. And then reading that complex expression from inside, you do a map reduce on P, this, this, this big data set, uh, with the map reduce functions we saw before, uh, bring that, that set, that map reduce function computes center, so the output is not, the assuming it, it's a smaller uh, output that we can bring into memory with from the FS. We discard the keys, we take only the values, the values are a matrix. So now C is a matrix. No merging of it's all done for you. And C is a, a normal, regular R matrix. Then if you're using combiners, a little post-processing to do in the last lines, and there's a graphical primitive here uh, to show some uh, nice colors moving around. Yeah. 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 And the last slide, it just, uh, uh, sorry, not the last. Uh, uh, this is a little heuristics to, uh, sometimes when you apply this algorithm, you may lose the number of centers, can decrease. So this is a little heuristic to toss in some new random centers. If uh, some centers get orphaned, they have no neighbors, they disappear. And so this is a little heuristic to do that, and nothing might produce about this. And this is, uh, again, how to create some random data uh, to see it in action, and some graphics to see nice colors. And, uh, and here, it's uh, this, the combined call. Uh, it's about a fifth of the, of the code uh, that went into the other implementation. And, uh, and uh, it's a single language, it's very important. Uh, and, uh, with that, I think it's time to wrap it up and, and take some questions. <coughs> I see you have the matrix and then the column with the minus one is the last column. <coughs> uh, I'm guessing a negative number as an index of a matrix. But that's in the combiner thing, so you were not supposed to see it. <laughs> I, uh, you know, it's a real code, so I, I, there's an advantage, disadvantage, show you real code is that this is slightly confusing. No, it's not, it's not Python, it's uh, R. So minus one means everything but the first line, but the first, uh, but the first. Oh. Uh, yeah. So in, in the combiner, we, we can't take means because they're not a shows as, associative. So we have an additional column that's a column. And we take sums and then divide, find at the end to get the mean at the end. Oh. Does the Redo project require you to install R on each node? And why is that? Yes, it does. Why, why is that? If you're just running through normal map why do you have to install R on each node? So, uh, okay, the, the first question is, do you have to install R on every node? The answer is yes. And the follow-up question was? Why? If you're just doing that, why do you have to install R? Because the mapper and the reducer are R programs. Well, they're native. You're not generating job. No, I wish there were a compiler for R. Gotcha, they, they, gotcha. They, there's, there's some ex experiments, you know. There's the, there, well, there's the byte compiler, which is largely interpreted. Okay. <laughs> and there's uh, the compiler to C, uh, which is an experimental university project. Uh, <coughs> so it's not ready for prime time. So two questions. So first of all, an extension of what you asked, you, know, you are using Hadoop streaming, I guess, right, to ship the code uh, across the board. That's correct. We have, we have two backends. So there's a little abstraction for the backend. The, f the main, most important thing is Hadoop streaming. Uh, the other thing is a local backend that you can use for very small kind of uh, uh, mock computations, but it's fantastic for learning and debugging because uh, and debugging. you can trace through, through the map, which is very difficult to do in any other setting, right? Even in Java, I remember that to trace through the map, we had to run the program instead of There was no other way. That was a few years back. Maybe now there are better tools better. So, so there's two backends. That means we have enough abstraction for you to Maybe you can a, a, a native backend, like a Java backend using RJava, which is the RJava interface. Uh, uh, 
it, our Java doesn't work very well on two out of three platforms that you care about, so uh, that's a problem. But other than that, it's probably you would have the latest and greatest API available. Streaming is not available as hard. So, and people will say, why not try a, a Elastic Map Produce backend? That's probably very similar to the streaming backend. And why not uh, uh, some other a parallel backend, like SMP backend, uh, you know, so that you can finish your computation in memory. Or stuff like that. So that there's the room for yeah. expansion. So right. uh, what about the, the repay, right? The R H I P repay uses R Java and right? yeah. post Java directly. Yeah. That's correct. So that will be anyway, so the other question <coughs> is um, about the, the code you showed in the key key uh, map mapper and reducer R functions. <coughs> sometimes you get sometimes you interpret the key and values as matrices, sometimes as data frames. So do we have how do you know? It's always the data frame. It's, okay, it's it depends on what it was in the previous phase. But the the, the, so the, so that information the, 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 the bow is never change the type behind the back of the user. Okay. So when the first version everything was coming out as, as lists and you have to put them together. With 2.0, I pissed everybody because I changed in no backward compatible ways. But uh, the promise is if you if you uh, return the a matrix you're going to get the matrix in the, in the whatever the map returns uh, the, the reducer gets and you write it out to file for the reducer if it's a data frame the map is going to see data frame okay. never change if you're reading other formats again with CSV we default to data frames of course now we are outside our, our world so we have to do some mapping and uh, and uh, I think uh, with uh, uh, with type bytes, uh, it's, uh, it's a fully specified serialization format, so whatever the data is saying, we, we follow. If it's a vector, it's a vector. We, don't, we try to map uh, the definition of type bytes to our types. We probably didn't do a very good job. It's, it, it's always a guess you know, how you map things. And, uh, and uh, if it's a text, we map it to a character vector, it was the only option. Right? With JSON, I think we largely give you a bunch of options how to do the map, and I, I left it flexible, but uh, it's not the real JSON, it's a dialect, so don't take it too seriously. Uh, then I go back and try to spend like this. Is it possible to rewrite the native functions in R to, to do the map reduce and not have to rewrite the R code uh, so, that, so that libraries do not need to be ported? No, because uh, 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 it's, it's possible to rewrite the uh, uh, well, I didn't understand the first part, but the last part was enough to respond now. So, uh, so the idea is that if, if you write so code in a certain way, you don't have to port the libraries. Yeah, so here, here if we have a library, then uh, an R library, then we have to port it and rewrite it to work. Yeah, so the, 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 okay. is there a way to avoid the porting of each library to the reproduce framework? Yeah, the answer is. Uh, in my opinion, is no. We have we have strong evidence that some arguments are impossible to parallelize, and, uh, and we have experience with parallel arguments for decades. And we st it's still a hard job uh, to to express parallel arguments. So the fact is, the parallel algorithm is not the fault of the sequential algorithm, because uh, algorithm is a s fully specified uh, behavior of the machine. If it's parallel, it's by definition it's not sequential. So even if sometimes they're very similar, it's always a different algorithm. And there is no evidence that we can do that in an automated way. But there's one exception. Whatever is impossible for mere mortals is being done at Google. So <laughs> uh, uh, Google has a big data data frame that you access like a data frame. And, uh, and magically, it goes out to the hyperspace and, uh, and it comes back with the stuff you want. And then I started asking, but can you do this? Like a basic operation data frames. No, that, that you can't. Not even if said yes in the room. So, uh, so the question is, they try to do things like they are porting uh, one function at a time, and they have a good framework to do it, but it's still manual work. So they have a way that if the function is really simple, plain vanilla, you don't have to rewrite it. It gets like a, like string split for some magic reason. They can uh, parallelize it without telling you. But uh, my sense from talking, it's so proprietary. You don't see any, right? But for talking to them is that there are serious limitations there. But, you know, it's it's a big thing. Rewriting everything parallel is a is a big task for the next uh, two decades, I think. You know, and 
and whoever chips away just this tiny bit, it's, it's, it's useful. You know, it's not, I'm not saying that it's not worth it, but the general thing that all 4,000 packages are running, you know, that's, I think, going to happen during my lifetime, which is very short. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that an alternative would be partition the big data set and then run a make a bunch of small models. Right? Uh, well, that's more if your problem is to find a way you are in very good shape. If you can define small models and aggregate them, if there is a statistically sound way of fitting the coefficients, and you know, I'm a computer scientist, just take the media and it's going to work. <laughs> but if you're a statistician, so, you know, you're you, you, you looking at it deeper. So, 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 so the follow to my question, so some people, uh, you know, particularly Jeremy Howard and Hegel, likes to say that in practice, most of these big data sets have problems that people want to solve on them. There is a natural partition. And it makes sense just to build a whole bunch of small models and do the problems that you have. I'm wondering what your, what your take on that is. Yeah, I mean, if I own the company, I would be that optimistic. Uh, fortunately, the consent is a bit more realistic about things. You know, just, uh, you know, the interesting things are when, when there isn't, you know, when, when you have to do to, to, you know, a logarithmic set of passes to, to actually finish your computation. You know, when, when it's, you, you cannot go down to constant number of passes. That, uh, nobody can prove that yet. I mean, but, uh, uh, you know, but, uh, those are the interesting. How do you do connected components on, on the on the you know on the true diagram, whatever whatever graph you have, guys? I don't know what it is. Uh, you know, uh, homes that have exchange that have had the same tenant or owner in the last <coughs> 50 years. Truly, for example, most of our data sets have a natural partition of geography. It makes sense to build separate models <coughs> in geographies. Well, the graph I said just doesn't. You know? Yeah, that's true. Because it's people start moving like crazy, like uh, that. But, but yeah, of course, homes don't move that easily. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about your partnership between uh, MapR and Revolution? It says the limit is supported to Red Hat, not the other platforms, and they point back to you. That's first question. Second is, do you expect Python uh, interfaces to all of this happening down the line? Uh, uh, so, sorry, I, I heard a little bit of question about the operating system. I heard that right? So and then I heard Python. So that's two separate yeah, things, two separate. right? Yeah, okay. So, uh, uh, we just did a concession, you know, it's open source, but somebody has to point out the money for me to develop it. So, uh, uh, Revolution and other two companies have highlighted CentOS as, a, uh, or that as a operating system of choices. So we test harder on that, but uh, there is absolutely no reason why I shouldn't run. I run it on Darwin every single day. So. I don't even say because, but, you know, it's it's tested. You know, I tested on two for R two fourteen a version back because Revolution R is always one of these back, but uh, well, yeah, most of the time. Uh, but I run it on two fifteen every day on my laptop and it works. So uh, I see no reason why I should have run on Ubuntu. I I run it on Ubuntu seven times. The other question interfaces with Python. Uh, uh, I don't know how deep. Want, but we pick the type bytes uh, uh, binary format as an interchange format. It's also the native format actually is based on type bytes in, in mixed with our native stuff. Because it was developed, it had been developed by the Dumbo developer, and Dumbo is a library and runtime for Python and MapReduce. So I say, well, at least we have two projects on it, we're going to be fine. And now Adupa is using type bytes as well. Uh, and, uh, I think as a as a type by its uh, uh, format, the uh, serialization format. Uh, actually, I'm sure because they duplicate all the code, so I, I know that for a fact. Uh, so uh, it, it, there are some quirks, but in general, you can read it from a high job, put it in a file, and you read it from other file. And it should be possible to go back and forth from downloads. And I do find. Has anybody tried? Okay, that that's that's. Uh, that's a kind of integration I have in mind. I know that people use streaming and do the mapper in R and the Python and do in Python. Uh, I'm not that smart. I'm not going to follow them there. I mean, it's just uh, uh, that kind of uh, mixed language programming. We're not. It's not on the radar at all. Um, so we can wrap it up here. And no. <laughs> uh, so it's. 
it's terrible but improving. <laughs> so uh, the the only jobs uh, uh, run for really like a, you know, depending on how you implement the map. If I implement it, uh, they run like, you know, a 5x multiplier over, over Java, which is uh, a notch behind the, the Python alternatives in some cases. And, and the, the user is still a, a serious problem. And unfortunately, very much, very much on it for 2.1. Uh, the dev version is already 10 times faster than the previous version. And uh, we might have to add something to the API to allow people to write also faster than users. So that's a big thing, and we're pretty pretty weak there. But uh, uh, I did uh, today, I ran a, a 20 gigabytes uh, natural language processing test. Uh, most of the time was spent in the reducer, so where we have uh, room, a lot of room for improvement, and it was a 10x job overall map reducer. So, you know, there's a price to pay, but, you know, we focused really much, not only my decision, but also my marching orders were to get the API right. So, really, the work towards efficiency starts now. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of room to make it faster. Yeah. How do you uh, configure the cluster? Are you making calls in, within the R language to give the, I don't know, the IP address and the authorization? We rely very much on Hadoop. So, the moment you can do an Hadoop streaming job, uh, uh, not involved in R, like one of the best Hadoop streaming jobs that are at the command line, there are, there are in documentation, right? It means that your loop is, is uh, configured appropriately, then we can pick up whatever that is. And you need only two environment variables to, to let R know where two other components are that it needs. The one is the main jar, and the other is the streaming jar. So it's really a hands-off approach. We didn't want to get into that, that stuff. Which helps, because you know, when, when something is not working, they say, well, is it R, is it? And uh, you go up, you just launch a streaming job with a mapper, like some Unix command, and whatnot. If it works, you know the problem is out. Well, uh, I'll be around for a few minutes more, I think, uh, to have more questions. But thank you so much for coming.